always forget. Uh, so we are live. What's going on, everybody? Jared James here. Uh, hope you didn't miss us over the weekend uh, uh, doing these happy hour with Jared James. I'm really excited today that I have Dan Elsie with me from uh, Real Estate One, president of Brokerage Services. Uh, I'll go into in a second why we're doing this and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Dan, do you want to say hello to everybody? And at the same time, this is a happy hour. So uh, what are you partaking on, uh, partaking in on this happy hour? Uh, hello, everyone uh, across, uh, across the country. And uh, I have a combination of, uh, of little tequila and, uh, and lime and, of course, a glass of water just in case, because you never know. So hey, the last know. person, the last person that did tequila on here uh, was Hobie. And uh, I have heard from many people that was their favorite conversation. So maybe it's the tequila. Okay, maybe. Good. Uh, I am going from a nice local brewery, a little too juicy. Uh, uh, TWO, too juicy. Uh, double IPA um, from Two Roads Brewing Company. Uh, once again, I failed to plan <laughs> for, for uh, what I was going to have today. So I literally just reached in the fridge and whatever was there. Uh, I did a, originally I did a... Uh, a white claw on one of them because it was all that was in there and I caught a lot of crap for that like people are making memes on the sure. internet and questioning my manhood and you know all of these kinds of mean things but I'm a big boy I can take it so uh just so you know man so first off I appreciate you uh being on here um you know the real point here was basically to talk to the leaders of the industry about what's going on and really hear your story and you know what are you guys doing now and where's opportunities and really just hear directly from the people who are really running the industry so, you know, real estate one, I, I think I've worked with you guys as a brokerage wide overall uh, company for at least a couple years. Yeah, it, probably somewhere in there. three or four. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it's longer. I'm really bad with the time frames, but it's been a little while. Uh, yeah. It's one of my favorite uh, relationships. I mean, I was just at your guys event. You do an amazing job. Uh, it's one of the few places that uh, I actually go to the after party afterwards uh because i've gotten to know so many of you guys and you guys are so much fun and everything um but amazing event you guys put on so much fun uh how many agents are you guys now um we're about 2500 for a company owned and uh and franchised in about 75 offices across the state okay so when you said 2500 and that's company owned and then franchise so do you do you separate between company owned and franchised well, we since since we're all Michigan and and just a family company, we I mean we separate them technically, and that we've got about twenty five franchised offices, and the rest are company owned. But but in terms of culture and how we approach it, we look at franchised as the same as company owned, and participation and services and all. So family owned. Uh, explain to me what that means. Like I mean I know what family owned means, but like uh, who's the family? What is yeah. your role? What are their roles? Like you know. You know, how long has it been around? Did you take it over? Did you start? Like, like, what's the what's the story on on the company? Uh, well, we we were ninety years old, so uh, and I don't look. I know I don't look nearly that old, so it's not me. Okay. Uh, it's uh, gr a grandfather started, so we're in. My brother and I now run the company. Went from my grandfather to father to uh, to my brother Stuart and me. So we've been in doing that for now thirty plus years. Uh, we're now in our fourth generation. We've got our kids in the business just starting off now. So we're one of those rare, um, rare family businesses that survived the first, second, and now third and fourth generation. Now it's, yeah. So I want to get into that. Uh, before I do, because this is a happy hour show, guys, if you are watching this right now, take a picture of the drink that you've got during happy hour, post it in the comments below. Cheers, Dan. I know you just took a sip, but <laughs> I guess we're making you. By the way, what I've found is happening during these shows is that a ton of uh, drinking games are, start, are starting up where like if I say a certain word and I don't know in any of them what the word is, but I think it really helps the comments <laughs> when that happens. So guys, take a picture, put it below. Uh, this is obviously for Real Estate One. If you know a Real Estate One agent, tag them in the comments below. Uh, share this. Uh, I know Dan and so I know this is gonna be a really good conversation. Uh, I'm interested to find out the answers to a lot of the things uh, that I want to hear about, not only from their company, but also, you know, industry-wide right now. So do me a favor, take a picture, post it in the comments of what you're having there, and uh, tag agents below, people that you know, the colleagues, and share this, guys. Hit that little share over there, and let's get this out to as many people as we can, because I, I think it's going to be of great value. Um, and quite frankly, when you get these people on here, um, you know, it's really nice of them to share their time and such, and so uh, I always, I always think we should be able to try to get it out to 
as many people as we possibly can. Okay. So let's get back into that. So family owned business. Uh, what was it like when you took it over? Was it similar size? Have you guys grown? Like what's, what's the, what's the story? We're probably um, maybe two or three times larger than we were when uh, my brother and I started. So uh, we were uh, 1929, grandfather started the company. Um, he was kind of a maverick guy of that era. He, was, uh, he started a bunch of businesses and had a lot of ideas. He failed at most of it. Like Just those an entrepreneurial two. guy. Yeah, yeah. But he figured out how to uh, start a real estate business. He had the idea that- How weird uh, is that? You fail in a bunch of other places, but then real estate is where you succeed? Yeah, in an industry yeah. where 87% of people fail in the first five years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, uh, uh, he had an idea that if you got a lot of salespeople together in one place, this is before the MLS existed, that if you exchanged, if those agents could exchange their ideas, their clients, their needs, that you'd create, all the boats would rise. So he had an office of 70, 80 people in the 30s when everyone else had six or seven. Yeah. And uh, so he, he grew to become the biggest broker in Michigan at the time under Elsie Realty. Okay. And then uh, my father took it over and, uh, uh, and then he, uh, he luckily was more like my grandmother than my father, than my grandfather, because because he was all, my grandfather was all over the place and my grandmother was the stable force paying uh -huh. the bills and keeping things going. So the company had gotten big enough in the 40s and 50s that, that it needed someone who, who could do that. And my father was that person. So, um, so we grew dramatically. He started opening up branch offices in the su suburbs and, uh, and we continued to be the big broker in the state. We, um, we merged with a bunch of companies in the early 70s yeah. and grew even bigger. Uh, and that's when we changed the name from LC to Real Estate One. So that when was, was that, in the 70s? That was 1970, we actually What, what was that. the reason for that? Why did you change it? Well, the name was too long. It was uh, LC, Mather, Stevens, Martin, Deramo, uh, Williamson, and something else. So it just a joke, you're, 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 you're serious right now. Yeah, I'm serious. That was the name of the company? <laughs> yeah, well, because we merged with three other firms. <laughs> What were, you and, guys, were you guys an attorney's office? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, yeah, it was crazy. So, so we changed the name and, and, uh, uh, and had an ad agency that came up with a name. It wasn't, you know, it, it was a great name to use. So. Were they like anything but this? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's like 20 names lined up against each other. Yeah, yeah it, was, <laughs> it was silly, but, but luckily the uh, leveler heads uh, prevailed and we got, got a new name and, uh, um, and we, uh, we actually expanded in other, we were in other parts of the country. We're in Florida and the Carolinas and Missouri. You are now? We were then. Okay. And learned our lesson that that's, it's hard to run real estate companies a long ways away. I was going to so, say, I didn't, I didn't even think you, I didn't know you guys were. And I, I was all of a sudden going to like get angry at myself that I didn't know that. Like, no, I, no, I no. That, that was, this but, is back in the eighties and nineties. And, and by 2000, we were just focused on Michigan. And quite frankly, that's when we really grew dramatically. And you kind of figured like, let's be great at this area rather than kind of spreading too, too, uh, too thin all over the place. Is that kind of what was happening? Yeah, it was. That's really what, what, what is what the difference was. between you? So you mentioned your grandfather and your grandmother, uh, and those, you know, the level head with the, you know, all over the place type of thing. Uh, what's the difference between you and your brother? Uh, I have heard that you're two completely different people. We are. We are. Um, uh, but together, uh, what was it, I think in that Seinfeld uh, uh, um, episode when uh, Seinfeld and uh, you just want uh, to yeah, they got together and said it stands in between two of them. They make it. They make an actual person. Oh, I thought I thought you were gonna say that two worlds colliding when he oh, was no. bring, when he was gonna <laughs> when he when they wanted him to bring the girlfriend around and he's like. That George cannot stand with the George here. That's two worlds colliding. Like he wanted a separate world with Elaine and, and Jerry. And then he had a separate world with his girlfriend. And he's like, we cannot put these together. Yeah, the two different George worlds. Yeah, the, the Seinfeld worlds. No, it's, this is um, for us. I could do, by the way, I could do Seinfeld examples with you all day long. Uh, <laughs> and I know you're going to get to your serious answer in a second. But like, do you, watch, do you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, my yeah. God. Yeah. How great was this last season? Oh yeah, it was. Oh. Uh, Short of maybe episode two or three, which was a little bit slow. I forget which one it was. That was maybe their greatest season. Oh yeah. I, I mean, just I, I can't have, I have, that's a more fun cringing there than anywhere else. <laughs> it is just amazing. It, it, it's probably the funniest show on television. Like yeah. it's, uh, my wife used to say that uh, being married to me was like being married to Larry David. 
<laughs> which, <laughs> I don't think I let people see that side. Yeah. Um, but I'm very much the guy that like when I, if I show up in a restaurant and sit down and they have the menu on the plate, I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like that is disgusting. Like that is literally, or they'll have the silverware, you know, like right on the wooden table or on the whatever, like not like a cloth table, but like a wooden one. And I'm like, can I get new? Like, this is, this is gross. And they're like, what do you mean? It's a, we wiped it down. I'm like, with a rag? You wiped down the table with a dirty rag? And now I'm supposed to put forks and knives there? So my, my wife said it's like being married to Larry David. And I, and I still haven't decided whether that is a compliment or like a backhanded slap. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it's the other way. So, so for you, uh, wearing gloves might be a permanent thing. <laughs> the thing is, man, I'm not a germaphobe. Like, look, I'll touch stuff, I'll whatever. It's just about food and beverage. Yeah. And then um, I've always said that uh, my mind works very much like a, like a stand-up comedian um, in the way I view things and the way I see things and everything. And so, you know, I get labeled like a motivational speaker. But the truth is, like, if left to my own devices, if I walk out into the world, like, I notice everything that's not right and everything that's like I can't, can't turn it off, right? Um, and it's, you know, when you, when you come up with like my theories on things and groups and people and all this other kind of stuff, it's, it's like being married to Larry David. It's, well, it's I hide it well though. I hide it really well. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> so, so, um, Your question about my brother, uh, Stuart and I, the, yeah. the, um, the, um, what I do for, with the company is I do, I'm, my view piece is the brokerage side. So all right. the brokerage offices and all that piece. And Stuart's piece is the financial side, which is our title, our mortgage, our relocation, our franchising, all of those pieces. So that gives you a little bit of our personalities. We're not- What does that, that mean? Long. So you're on the brokerage side, meaning you're dealing with the actual brokers, meaning yes. like uh, any issues, any, you're, you know, you're making sure you're networking and talking to them, communications alive. Like, what does that mean? Yeah, it's, it means we, we have our, our team that, that works. We have our branch managers. We have our, uh, our um, regional people. So that's my side of it, is working with salespeople, managers, or regional people, and, and all that in the brokerage piece. And then when it comes to the title, mortgage, how that interacts, our third-party relocation company, property management, all the, everything that plugs into the brokerage business is what Stuart does. So, so his background is accounting, my background is marketing and, uh, and some finance. So, so we're on either side of the spectrum, but not far on either side. We're, I'm on one side, he's on the other. But, but your uh, personalities are different. Like, yeah. like I remember sitting between the two of you, I think, I think I did your event years ago before, I think before uh, you guys were like a brokerage wide client and just so everybody listening knows when I keep saying that brokerage wide client, I just mean that all of your agents are in our programs. They're in our, they've got access to your branded blueprint course. They've got, they're in our, our weekly uh, uh, virtual sessions, you know, on training. We do series every single month to keep them trained and such. But before any of that happened, um, I remember it was either right before or right after I went up to do like a keynote at the thing or something. I was sitting in between the two of you and I didn't even know who you guys were at the time. And then I met you and, and uh, found out who the both of you were. And I remember you guys being completely different, <laughs> like, like two different personalities. Like, how does that work? Does it work good? Or do you guys want to kill each other half the time? Uh, you know, it works pretty well. I mean, we get along. So yeah. Do, do we have disagreements? Of course. Um, but uh, because we're brothers, we roll with those pretty well. I was so. going to say, aren't there liberties taken that when it's your brother, you can actually show when you're angry? Oh, yeah. Uh, opposed to like if it was just like, you know, somebody who was hired through corporate or something and you've got to be a little bit more political about it or, or, you know, and just kind of maybe there's a different way to, you know, whatever. Like, do you find that because you're brothers, you can actually tell each other what you're thinking? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> there, there, there are wonderful benefits to family businesses. And that is one, too. And and. I mean, we certainly have each other's personalities, but we also know each other very well. So we know how to adjust. Did you so grow I, up I, together? Like, are you like brothers, like you grew up in the same house type of thing? Oh, yeah. yeah so we're, now, we're only, have, you ever, have you ever had like an awkward Thanksgiving because of like business dealings at work? You know, it's, it's funny because, because, you know, being three generations, it, it, uh, it used to be for our Thanksgiving, it would particularly when my grandfather was, was alive, we'd be all around the, the table and it'd be about, oh, three or four minutes of family conversation. And then one of us would say something about business. And then we dive into this heavy business conversation and the rest of the family would roll their eyes and say- I was gonna say, are the spouses and everything, like, would you guys just shut up? Like, yeah. I will say that when we had grandchildren, Stuart and I had our kids, that changed. And my father, 
uh, was his focus was on grandkids. So it, so our conversations at the family gatherings did change for a while. Meaning, but then the kids like got his, older. His, like this was he was in a different stage of his life, and it was yeah, just yeah, like yeah, it's about yeah. this it's, now. He had, he had stepped back at that point, and uh, so he was uh, he was sort of the the patriarch, and the the kids yeah. and the grandkids took over. But then then of course we've fallen back into that same rut again. So we're back there. So did he, was he kind of like the driver of uh, conversation or what you guys would be focused on because he was like the patriarch type of thing? Like, was he the driver of the conversation there or what was acceptable to talk yeah. about at dinner and stuff? He was, he was certainly in that. He was, um, uh, and, and, you know, he was a big personality in the, in the business as was uh, my grandfather before him. So, uh, but he also did a great job when it came to transition um, of step, he, he announced that he was going to retire at 70 and yeah. he did, uh, he passed away at, at 83, but so he, at 70, he, he, he retired. And then about six months later, he was back. That's why I said, did he really retire? Because I feel like, uh, when that's been your whole life and you know, 70 is not as old as like, you know, I mean, you're still there, like you're still with it. You're still, you know, yeah. I can imagine it's very difficult to take a step back. Did, did you guys have any kind of, because I've seen this with other companies, uh, did you guys have any kind of like, okay, he's gone, but then he comes back and keeps trying to change decisions or question things, and you guys are like, this is ours now, like you're trying to be respectful, but really it's like, hey, you know, he, go retire. Well, yeah, see, there, there, I would get probably once a week a call from a manager that said, you know, your dad just called me. Um, should I be doing this? But, but aside from that, he actually was, he, he struggled a little bit with his father in the transition. So when he transitioned with, with Stuart and with me, he actually was very good because he had been through that before. So he, he went out of his way to make sure that, uh, that he stepped back and uh, there, he couldn't help himself on occasion. And, and I know that Stuart and I won't be able to help ourselves either when, when that time comes. So I, I get that. I was going to ask you, you think you'll be the same way because I completely get that. Like, I mean, that's so difficult. You spend your whole life you know, building and, you know, whatever, that's just got to be difficult. Um, yeah. Are you, are you then because, you know, I know you guys have offices all over. Again, uh, I work with you guys. And that's why when you just said Florida and whatever, I was like, what? Like, I didn't even know about these people. But now I feel better because they're not there anymore. Uh, so are you mainly in the corporate office? Or are you having to kind of like jump around and go be seen at these various offices? Most of my time is, uh, I'd say that the majority of the time is spent out in offices and, and either at sales meetings or um, regional meetings or meeting with, with agents and different groups. So yeah, so most of my time is spent out and about in the branches. How many miles are you putting on a year? <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I'd have to look. It's probably not too bad. It's probably 18,000 or so. It's not too bad because most of our offices, the majority are concentrated in Southeast Michigan. We've got a large uh, operation in Northwest and the resort communities Northwest, but most of it's Southeast. So, so it's not too bad. How many Zoom calls have you done uh, in the last uh, two weeks, let's call it? I, I'm not sure I can rival yours, but I, actually one of our <laughs> managers, had a con she had a contest as to how many Zoom calls I had last week. Uh, it was probably 28, maybe 30 or so. Isn't it was crazy, it? man? Like yeah. Zoom is becoming a verb. Like, like, it's going to be like, uh, oh, go Google that. People are going to be like, oh, let's Zoom. Oh, yeah. Or let's, you know what I mean? Like, it's already, it's, it's crazy, man. Did you hear how they were, you know, buying stock and stuff? And there was this other company called Zoom, and they had to shut down the purchase of the stock because they, people were buying the wrong stock. It was oh. an unprofitable company, but it was called <laughs> Zoom. And so everybody's buying this stock thinking it's super cheap, but really it's this other Zoom in like China or something. Oh my uh, and they had to actually halt trading on it. Did you hear about that? No, no, that makes sense, but it's amazing. Yeah. My God, like, I mean, it's, 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 you know, everybody who wasn't, have you tried to do a Zoom call with anybody and they jump on and try to not do video? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, make yeah. it stop. Yeah. I, I, I mean, come on, it's, we, we, the one thing I think that's gonna come out of this uh, for sure is people are gonna be more comfortable on video. Like, yeah. they have to be. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the way of the world now. It's, uh, I think it's shown people, maybe even you guys too, you know, how many meetings you could be doing like this where you don't need to, you know, drive all the way over there or do whatever. Like, I think this has really opened up the world a little bit for people to realize in an area that maybe they were uncomfortable. Like, wow, this is, this is completely doable. Like, this is, you know. Oh yeah, we'll get, I'll, I've noticed that I'll do like four or five sales meetings in a day where I used to be able to do one or two. 
and quite frankly, the attendance is probably twice as high yeah. as it was. So it is, it's a, it, there, there are silver linings in all this. And one of those is, is communication method. And I think just business methods, there's always silver linings in any crisis. And I think communication and how we do business, the electronic process of managing business will, uh, will permanently change. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I want to know, so you had mentioned, this is always interesting to me when, when it comes to brokerages of your size. And, you know, there's a big difference between, you know, I've, I've obviously, um, I've been interviewing on these happy hours, you know, CEOs of, you know, Remax and Coal Banker and, you know, and I always enjoy talking to people like you who are running, not those global, you know, 120 country, you know, whatever, but you're, you're hitting a specific area like you talked about, right? Yeah. When did you guys introduce uh, things like title, insurance, mortgage, you know, those kind of things? When did they come about and why did they come about? Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, I'd like to say that it was a grand strategic plan thought of in, uh, in boardrooms where we got together. And, but it really was something that evolved over the years. Uh, back in the 50s, my father had difficult time getting the title business organized and closings as fast as he wanted to. So he said, "The heck with it! I'll start my own closing department." Which turned you guys are a title state, right? Not an not an attorney state. You guys are a title state. We're a title state. Yes. Yeah, so okay. so we grabbed that. So our title business came out of the need to give better service to our clients and control the situation. Meaning and meaning you, meaning you bought one, or meating you no, just we started, started the process. Yeah, we started. We from started from, you started from scratch. Yeah, we did. What year was that? Well, that would have been probably in the early 60s, late 50s. And it just was a, it was our closing department. It wasn't even a title company. It was the closing department. And we contracted with a title company to give us the actual policy. And then it, over time, that evolved into a full title agency. So, so it was, just so I understand here, um, number one, it was to, to keep things in house so that you guys had more control because your closings were kind of not happening quick enough. You didn't have enough control over them, that stuff. And even in the beginning, then you weren't even a true title company. You were you were contracting an outside title company that was working within your closing department. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, but we quickly became a title agency over time. And, and actually, there was there was a time when uh, in the state of Michigan where a broker could not own a title company. Wow. So we so we had a title company um, that we had a tight relationship with. And then in the, gosh, it would have been the 80s or so, that changed and we purchased that title company. And uh, so it went from- uh, how, how, do you, how do you, when you purchase a title company, because I know how to evaluate a tech company, I know how to evaluate a real estate company, I know how to evaluate, how do you evaluate a title company? Is it like a certain number of multiples over revenue? Is it a, how do you evaluate a title company? Well, I have to say, since the title company that we bought was 99% the business we gave it. That's why I was asking the question, because I'm going, the, the you're term, really... The terms you know, were favorable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly why I was asking the question, because I'm going, if you're bringing them in, you're probably the majority of the, the business that's coming in right there. So how do you evaluate that? Because if you're going to take a multiple of revenue, pull all your business and buy them in three months. You know, all right, your revenue is almost nothing, you know, like that's, you know. Yeah, no, that was, a, I, I don't remember the exact terms, but, but it was, it was extremely favorable. Um, I love it. It was favorable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and actually for the, ins the home insurance side of things, the, the same thing happened there. We, we, people would come up, would go to closings, they'd forget their insurance policy. Oh my God. So the lender would say, I can't fund this till you have insurance policy. Don't so tell me this is how it. your insurance company was born. Yeah. So my father had a friend that was in the insurance business. He said, sit in this conference room next to our closing room and just wait. You're going to sell lots of policies. And then that blossomed into an insurance business. So, um, so we did that. And Is that difficult actually, like, to actually get all the licenses you need and all that kind of stuff? Like, it's not no, that difficult? No, it wasn't. We did that probably that was back in the 80s as well. And then, then also in the mid 80s, we, um, we, uh, this is coming out of the recession of the early 80s. People needed help getting bridge loans. So they couldn't, they couldn't buy the house till they could sell theirs. So we got in the bridge loan business and called it John Adams Mortgage, but it was a bridge loan company. Wow. 
Wow. And then from there, that evolved into a, a mortgage bank. So we're now a, we're a, a lender. But so, so each of those pieces came out of a need to service specific clients in our business. And then we've knitted that all together into a- well, Really that came from though, like, like when you look at stuff that, that I teach and other people teach in today's world, it, it's all about the transaction and how to make the transaction smooth. And you know, how do we eliminate barriers in that transaction? And you know, what softwares and technologies can do that and all that kind of stuff, right? It, it's basically every, every real estate person right now should be figuring out uh, or trying to figure out how how do we Amazon this process? How do we one click shop this process uh, to make it as easy as possible for people? It's it's the same thing back then. You guys were trying to figure out how to make this smoother. Now you, you didn't have the same technology we had today. You didn't you know whatever. But really, it was in an effort to say how do we make this smoother? It's like what's old is new again, right? I mean, it, it, that's really where it came from. No, yeah, yeah, it's true. That's exactly where it's so. And, and, uh, and from each of those seeds of need, of client need, we, we developed, the, the, each of those grew uh, quite a bit. So now our business is, you look at our business structure, it's really half brokerage and half pieces tied to brokerage in terms of size of the, of the organization. But of course, the brokerage piece feeds it. So without the brokerage, the other ones wouldn't exist. So that, that's what's interesting. So, so you're saying it's half and half, the brokerage feeds, but from a profitability standpoint, title mortgage insurance in most brokerages that, that I work with and I'm aware of are much more profitable than the brokerage. Is, yeah. is that the case with you guys as well? Yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, you, you used a, a example, I think before about car dealers, we use the, we often use the example of, uh, of movie theaters, the brokerage business yeah. is the ticket and then the, the popcorn, everything it's the other, that's where you really make your money on the other stuff. So, so where, when did you guys go full time into now we have, like, when did the aha moment come in and you guys went, Oh, like, this is what we need to be doing. Like we need to be mortgage title insurance. Like this is where it needs to be. Uh, when, when, when did that actually happen that you had all three running and you were like, Oh, what were we missing out on this whole time? Our, our actually we've been we've been doing the, the aha for a while. It's probably back in the uh, mid '90s. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so we've been, but each year you get you get better at it, and we learn because we we own all of them, so we're not joint ventured. So we have to learn the process and hire the right people. And are they considered separate companies, or are they all under one parent? They're actually all under. Well, they're they're um, they're separate corporations, but they're all under one parent. So it's one entity, so. What do you think the next, I'm thinking out loud right now, and this is like a perfect example of like what I would say to you if we were at happy hour. What's the next thing? Like, because we all know it's title mortgage insurance right now, right? Yeah. And then you look at a company like Compass that came in and they were like, we'll do home repairs, <laughs> you know, like, and started looking at whatever. Like, I don't expect you have an answer right now because I've, I've never asked anybody this, but I start to wonder like, with everything shifting and technology and all this other kind of stuff, like what's going to be the next profit maker? Because there's always something like that. You know what I mean? Like things always shift and things always change. And then there's something that comes up that once you realize that it's right under your nose the whole time and you didn't even realize it was there, you know, from a profit. I wonder what the next thing is going to be like. I, you know, it's, it's tough to say. I, I think that the, um, the challenge with the, um, the home repair and the, I buyer piece and all of those is that they're big users of capital and and most brokerage services are at providing a service so they're not they're not capital design businesses they're I mean what a brokerage business is basically use furniture and people brains yeah so um, so it isn't really designed for that um, and I think that idea is an interesting one but I don't know that uh, it's, it's too early to tell whether that's something where there are margins in that that makes sense. But are you talking about the uh, compass thing? Yeah, the compass thing. I'm, yeah. I always crack up. I said this to someone the other day. Um, look, I, in my position, I don't get to be anti or pro any company. Uh, that's, that's not, I, I'm not allowed to do that. I do think it's funny that everybody's calling them a disruptor. And I'm, I'm like, what the heck is being disrupted? Like, it's the exact same model as everyone else. The only difference is that the first time we have venture capital introduced. You know, but it's not like it splits. It's it's all the same. Oh, we've got a CR. I mean, every company's releasing technology and doing. You know, that's 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 in my mind uh, not something any new. But you know, whatever. 
being being from in, in Michigan and Detroit, we don't really attract all of that VC ideas and and uh, programs. We don't have Compass in our market and others. So, yeah. so selfishly, I love all that. I love all the VC money being poured into our business because it's testing all the ideas now. Yeah. As, as if you follow- well, That's interesting. So you're saying it's being tested in another marketplace and you get to watch it and say, even though it's not affecting you, it's not competing with you. And you get to be like, hey, what should we be implementing? What shouldn't we? While other people are out there testing it in places that doesn't affect you. Yeah, yeah. We, we've been doing, we, we started doing iBuyers here. We're the only ones doing it really in our market because- And now you're the only one doing it, period. Because Zillow yeah. and Redfin and all these places backed out of every single contract they had. Yeah, well, we, we of course put ours on hold too for the time being, but but uh, prior to uh, uh, to the, um, the COVID issue, we've been out and, and doing it. But but we and we hired consultants from the other companies and 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 learned. So so I think it's that capital is great. Is it is um, it's to your point, it's stretching the boundaries of the business. It's it's allowing uh, uh, the business to explore new places that weren't possible without a whole bunch of capital because up until this yeah. point the brokerage business is is not particularly well capitalized the uh, you yeah. know the typical broker does in the franchise systems as well so no, no doubt. It's, it's some cool ideas and whether they work uh, or not probably most of the ideas will not work because that's usually the case with VC. Most VC yeah, ideas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're testing it, and then the one that takes off usually takes off big time. But you know, the other 99 are, you know, or whatever it takes off as, it'll take off as an iteration of what it really started as. So, yeah. uh, so, so I think that's really cool. Those ideas, and whether whether what our world will look, I think, I think our world will break up like everything else into that that continuum of of counseling versus facilitation and that the facilitation is the automated piece it's the buying your airline tickets online and and it's that piece and then there's the counseling which is truly helping your client and that's the concierge service whatever that looks like and our industry has been late to the table on breaking up along yeah. those lines we're yeah. kind of following the same lines as uh Healthcare and others, and that slow rise, but it, it'll happen to us. It ha it's that that changes across all businesses and all industries. So you guys are kind of watching that and watching the money coming in and seeing what they're putting it towards. I think it was interesting you said that you guys were doing an iBuyer thing now, uh, because to me it's one of the great opportunities. You know, they did a study and they found that um, like 94% of all sellers wanted an instant offer, uh, while like less than 1% actually accept an instant offer almost 94% want an instant offer. So we've been training our students to do things like, look, go to your local RIA, your real estate investor association, go to whatever it is, make relationships with like five different investors and start offering a guaranteed offer, like, you know, within 24 hours, whatever, because it'll get you in the door. Visibility trumps ability because everybody, every seller makes decisions for different things, sometimes for money, sometimes for convenience to leave, sometimes for whatever. But if you're able to, to uh, uh, advertise that, and get in the door, even though less than 1% of them are going to accept it. And you could say, yes, I can get you five hours within 24 hours. It's local investors. They're not going to be full price offers, but it gets you in the door. I was literally just talking to uh, one of the Zoom meetings today uh, was to our coaches. And we get together and we brainstorm and we talk about, you know, um, where opportunities are and what our students are doing and what they're doing and whatever. And there's a real opportunity right now for people in the iBuyer space from the perspective of everybody uh, shut down. Uh, Zillow and other places shut down mid-transaction. And one of our coaches was talking about how he did a video, promoted it out to his area, and basically said, hey, did you have an offer from Zillow, Redfin, whatever, that fell apart while you have another property under contract? We may still be able to come in and help you and started getting responses from people who were in that situation. They were under contract with another property. Now them selling their house they were going to do through Zillow, whatever it was, fell sure. apart. Now they're screwed because they're still on the line for the other property. And so he was able to go in there with his investors. And he even said, in some cases, uh, one or more of them actually took the investment offer. In a lot of cases, he went in and they, they were selling traditionally through him because they talked to him. They're like, no, that's not an offer I want to accept. But now they listed traditionally through him. And so my point is, and we'll probably be releasing this to your people real soon too. This is a real opportunity right now. Like anytime you see these things happen, there's always an opportunity. 
And you either bury your head in the sand and look back and go, oh, what are we going to do? Let's wait for everything to get back to normal. Or you strike when that's happening and you take advantage of the opportunity. And right now, when you look at all iBuyers pulling out, there's an opportunity right now for the agents who want to start creating content and videos directed towards those people who are in bad situations, who just had Zillow and other companies back out on them to come in as an opportunity. Again, visibility trumps ability. Um, so anyway, I, I think it's amazing you guys are doing that. And it's, uh, uh, you know, it's nice to know you're kind of paying attention to what are people doing? Where are they putting their money at? Because I think it's a mistake right now for the number of agents that are poo-pooing these other companies doing iBuyer. And they're ignoring the fact that 94% of all sellers want an instant offer. And it's the mistake that the industry keeps making is they're not listening to the consumer. They're only going what's good for me and not listening to what the consumer wants. Yeah, we've, we've looked at the surveys and, and done some research on our part. And, and the realtor community does, does uh, give some pre-negative press to, uh, to iBuyers. But when you talk to the consumers, the ones that we reached out to, they love it. So, um, so we, we have, although we also went with that formula of thinking that we would have maybe one in 10, one in 20 that we'd buy. Yeah. We were surprised when we first rolled it out. And we, we rolled it out at a limited level just to, to learn how to do it. And we were getting like five or six out of 10. And what we realized was our salespeople realized- Where are you doing it? Detroit, somewhere else? Where were you doing well, it? This is Detroit. But what we realized was that, that our salespeople saw this as a great opportunity for us to buy all their crappy listings. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, we had to adjust our model a little bit to make sure that, uh, that we were buying those listings that we probably could resell as opposed to just getting- uh, getting someone off the hook. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, I have another question, but my team is reminding me right now that I need to remind our viewers right now. I think we've had a steady uh, about 500 live eyeballs on Facebook right now, uh, which is awesome, guys. We're up on almost 300 comments, 30-something uh, shares right now, which is awesome. Uh, in the middle of all of these, I've been letting everybody know. Uh, a lot of your people come. Every year, we do a, a Jared James advance. We do uh, our yearly event where a lot of our students, followers, a lot of people from Real Estate One come. We bring them in for a two-day conference. This year, we're doing it in Nashville in October, which I'm sure everybody can't wait to come because everybody just wants to get out of their house. Uh, but one of the things we started doing on these, uh, these Facebook Lives is giving away a free ticket. Uh, so if you're listening right now and you potentially would like to uh, win a free ticket to the 2020 Jared James advance in October, two days of immersion and learning, you know, specific to where we are right now uh, and networking with top prof uh, professionals from all around the globe, really. Uh, here's what you need to do if you want to win a free ticket. Take a picture of your screen of, of you watching this Facebook Live or take a picture of yourself, you know, with the screen behind you with this Facebook Live. You are going to want to post it on Instagram and Facebook. I am at Jared James today. Uh, again, at Jared James today. And if one of my team could post in the comments, uh, the link connectwithjared.com. That's another easy way to find my Instagram and Facebook profile uh, on connectwithjared.com. You just click on Instagram or Facebook. You need to post a picture of you watching this. Tag at Jared James today with the hashtag happy hour with Jared James. We are going to look at it over the next 24 hours. We're going to pick a winner from someone who took a picture of this, posted it on Instagram and Facebook, uh, tag me at Jared James today uh, and put the hashtag happy hour with Jared James. We'll pick a winner um, and be announcing it usually within 24 hours or less and giving away a free ticket, okay? I'll also say during this really quick break right now, if you're liking this and enjoying it, uh, do me a favor and share it uh, with your people. That means other of your colleagues and other people would enjoy it too. I think there's a lot of really great info coming out here. So just hit share on Facebook right now. Make sure you're staying engaged in the comments below. Um, uh, and that's it for that. So. Uh, Dan, I want to ask you about, I love hearing about all the title, the insurance, the, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's really the business 101 stuff that somebody like me really geeks out on. Um, how have you guys grown? Have you, have you guys grown through acquisition? Have you, come, have you grown through recruitment? Have you grown through both? How do you decide which one? Like, how, how have you guys grown? Like, what's been your main strategy? We've, we're probably 50-50. Uh, in terms of organic growth and in terms of uh, of uh, experienced uh, or acquisitions or experience, about about half of our people that we bring in uh, every year are new to the business, and about half are experienced from somewhere else from the competitors. But we ha we have the largest licensed school in the state, so we bring a lot of people through that. So it gives us a chance to 
to sort of pick and choose. So, so that relationship with a licensed school, I think most brokers have some relationship with. Meaning, meaning that they do the classes and everything right in your yeah. offices. And yeah, then you get a chance own. to come in and say hello or somebody from your company at some point gets a chance to come in and, hey guys, welcome to the industry, get to know people and kind of try to talk to the people you want to talk to and let the other ones go. Yes, yes. So, so for us, because we have that, that's great. But even if you don't have a school, uh, certainly getting relationships with schools, most of them allow you to do the same thing and, and get in there. So, so that helps a lot. For, so we have a combination of new and experience. And, and we've done a lot of acquisitions. We, our, our acquisition strategy, at least the ones that Stuart and I have used, is, is a little different than most in that we have multiple brands. So, so we have uh, Real Estate One as our sort of flagship brand. Okay. We have uh, three other brands on the brokerage side as well. Um, Johnstone and Johnstone, uh, Max Brook and Reinhardt Realtors, all different brands. And in the brands, the two of the three are billion plus brands in their, on their own right. Why are so, they still separate? It's because you guys merged or acquired them and they had such a good brand already. It was, is it almost like when I was talking to Hobie Hanna the other day, you know, uh, he was talking um, uh, about, uh, what was it called, out of, out of uh, Virginia? Oh, yeah. Alan Tate? Yeah, well, not Alan Tate, but no, he has um, Alan Tate as well. Um, yeah. William E. Wood. Oh, William Wood. Tate, right. You know, yeah. those kind of things. And, and it was kind of like, like when they, you know, merged or, or acquired Alan Tate, it's like, well, that's, a, that's an established brand there. Like, why change their name? Yeah. Is that part of why you have those other brands still? Yeah, it is. It is. I think in, uh, in Hobie's case, he, they eventually did did change the brands, uh, uh, except for uh, Alan Tate, I think they changed the brands to Hannah across the board because- Yeah, that, I think yeah. Alan Tate, if I remember correctly, uh, I think Alan Tate's the last one that's still yeah. Alan Tate. I think yeah. William E. Wood switched over in a couple, yeah. yeah. So, so their, their branding structure is a little different than ours in that they, I think for the size, the footprint they have, it just makes sense for them to, to uh, bring them together. In our case, each of the brands are very specific in the market. Like our Max Brook brand is, was always the high-end carriage trade brand in the, that particular marketplace, the, the main market for Southeast Michigan. Our Johnstone Johnstone brand was the same thing in another market and actually Reinhardt. So the, all of them were sort of the upper end brands that had established themselves. I mean, the uh, Max Brook is, is a 125 year old brand in the marketplace. Yes. Johnstone Johnstone is a hundred years old. So, so these are long-standing brands um, and they have great market shares. So what, one of the things that uh, in one market, we have got a nearly a 50% share, uh, which is unheard of, but, uh, but it's because it's, we have two brands. If we had a single brand, I think we would cab off that share and we probably couldn't hold it. But because yeah, are they all run from the same place? They're run as one brand, but they operate as separate or, or like, how do you guys do that? Uh, it's a combination of both. Depends on, on the brand. Um, we have, depending on and, and location, but we, they, they are distinct in terms of branding, in terms of marketing, although we share all our marketing pieces across the board, but the websites, the marketing, the, the, uh, the visual to the public is unique and distinct and the agents are branded distinctly. But the backroom operations, accounting, um, administration, relocation. That's what I mean. The backroom stuff is pretty shared, right? But All shared. Uh, I, I feel like uh, after working with you guys for a number of years, I've, I've, I'm playing dumb a little bit. I know a little bit how they work. And I've, you know, I know a lot of the agents and everything. Uh, and I know that the ones that work for uh, the others, Max Brook and others, like they, they take it really kind of serious that we are Max Brook and we are, you know, it's kind of like a point of pride for them. I do. Um, and I would imagine that that was, you know, when the merger was happening or when the acquisition was happening, that was probably something that you guys not necessarily ran into, but like, kind of like, we want to keep our, you know, we're established here, right? Yes. And, and I, w I will also say that our branding strategy, again, was not one of those uh, brilliant um, strategic things. It was really, we were buying a, a firm in one of the markets and the, the, the broker who actually still is with us, uh, agent was, um, Dennis was, he and I were talking and he said, you know, I think you want to keep, we, that name we since we have since merged into Max Brook, but he said, I think you want to keep my name. It was called Ralph Manuel. Right. Because, uh, because it's a, it's a high end brand and I think you'll do it well. And I said, no, we're, we're real estate one. We're going to, we, we roll you into our brand. He said, no, nah, you want to do that. And so I, we did, we, we kept it. And then within two months, uh, another uh, broker, a friend of ours called and said, I think we want to, sell and we kept that brand that was Johnson and Johnstone and we learned that it was a great way of expansion 
salespeople appreciated that they they, yeah. they were part of that brand and uh and depending on the market it just made a lot of sense so who handles that uh, from your like when somebody wants to be acquired or there's an acquisition to be done um who's the person at your company who really kind of takes that call or or usually. i know you'd be in the room for that decision but i mean like is that you is that part of your yeah. role yeah that's usually that's usually it's a pretty decent size of what i do day to day is to reach out to brokers and uh, and uh, uh, let them know that when the time's right, we're here. So. I know that a lot of, uh, obviously I'm active in this industry, and a lot of acquisition that happens with a lot of uh, real estate companies, many times those real estate companies aren't worth anything. Meaning it, it's, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, right? Sometimes that conversation is, we'll take you over, you have an unprofitable company, and you can continue to, you know, uh, have a, uh, you know, a, a building, an office, whatever. Um, how do you determine, because obviously there's companies that are worth money and then there's companies that are not. How do you determine which unprofitable companies where really acquisition just means we'll take you over and we're going to try to turn this around. Uh, how do you determine which ones are worth it and which ones are not? <laughs> that's a good question. Is that uh, the first good question? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's um, you know, it, 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 it sounds a little cliche, but it is true. You look at culture first and, uh, and, and make sure it's a fit because from a, from a, from a personality standpoint, if the culture fits, then it just, it's just easier. And, and every company has their own culture. Yeah. Uh, salespeople can find a culture that fits their style across all the different brands, all the different styles. So you make right. sure that it fits first. And if it does, it's easier. And, and also your, the fact that the agents will stay is a big deal. So, so you want to make that as the first piece. And if the culture- and that is, By the way, that is a big thing because I've seen a lot of acquisitions where people are like, well, then I'm out of here, you know, whatever. So that's obviously a big part of it right there, right? Like you, yeah, you don't really want to take over a company and then your 50% of your breadwinners in that company take off. Yeah. So do you yeah. have a conversation beforehand? We you say like, hey, we're looking at doing this. Are you going to stick around, or or is it just kind of like a you know? <laughs> it's it's mainly this, but on occasion <laughs> we will, depending on the situation. There have been times we've had conversations with the key people in advance, but but for the most part, you do your research to know how they run their company, and when we know by how their agents react to our agents, and just so we and if it's a good fit, then that does change the value of the company a good fit with people who are going to stay. So, so we have, we have purchased in the past people, companies that would be considered unprofitable and therefore we've paid our multiple has been infinity because we've paid more than, and there's nothing there, but yeah, there's nothing there. Yeah. But we have because by folding, particularly if we can fold that operation into our branch or our branch into theirs, yeah. then you have obviously savings. So if you have saved some dollars and, the sales associates see value in that combined entity, then um, then you win. And we've had several of those. And, and you're looking at market share, geography, like, yeah. I mean, all of that stuff matters. Like, hey, we need somebody over here. This is, how do you deal with it when um, another company does things differently than you guys? They have completely different splits. They have completely different, like, is that a difficult conversation? Like when you're, when you're looking at a company and going like, we want to do this, like, here's what's going to be offered. We offer this to our associates. You know, you're going to get this technology. You're going to get this training. You're going to get this, you know, whatever. Are those difficult conversations? They are. Uh, and, and sometimes that means that you don't do the deal. That, that was my point. That was, that was kind of where I was going with it. Yeah. Yeah. No, there are times when it, where it just doesn't make sense. The, the, the structure just doesn't, doesn't fit. But uh, there have also been times when we've, we've looked at creating a whole different brand and different structure because we wanted to acquire um, uh, a business model that isn't part of our gotcha. current structure, but we will that. add another brand. And that's the flexibility that we have that maybe is unique and that Smart. If, if there's a business model that makes sense. Um, we for, for years had a, uh, as one of our brands was a real executives franchise. Yeah. We had five different real executives offices, which really? is weird for us to own a franchise, but we yeah. did. And uh, it's because it was a business model that is very different than our other brands. And, uh, and we wanted to, to try that model. And it, and it was, wasn't particularly effective for us, 
but it was a good experiment in, in a different business model for a different type of sales associate. But isn't that go back to what you said about the, the venture capital and stuff? Like that was your way of testing something it was. Uh, and seeing if it worked or not. And uh, is a lot of that dictated by uh, geography as well? Meaning that maybe they're in a marketplace where that's the norm. Yeah. And to try to come in with, with your model in that area isn't, isn't going to be favorable. So you're looking at it and you're looking at it from the brand perspective and going, okay, let's do a different brand in that area. That's what we have to do there. Is, is that, is that kind of what dictates that too? Like geography? It does. So we, we, our structure is different between brands and different in geographies for that very reason. Who came up with that idea to, to within the overall brand open different brands that do, do it differently. Yeah. Who came up with that? Uh, you know, I, I think I think we all did. I'm not sure there's any one. It's smart. I'm, I'm saying I'm saying it because it's really smart. Like especially when you're covering a certain area, um, because to think that this one size is going to fit all the different areas and locations and whatever, you know, it really doesn't. You know, so I honestly I think that's brilliant. I love that. Um, that's why I was asking. I was looking to give you some credit right now. I was. Gonna... <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it was. I don't remember whose idea it was. So it was. It was some brilliant person within our organization. I'm sure. Maybe yeah. Stuart, maybe me, I don't recall, but, but, uh, we're going to we edit this by the way. And we're going to, we're going to do a voiceover and you're going to say, it was all me. It was all me. Stuart fought me and it was all me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I like that. <laughs> That'll make for a good, a good Easter. <laughs> yeah. That, that'll make for a comfortable uh, Easter meal. That's right. You guys might be social distancing longer than you plan <laughs> <laughs> by the time we're done editing this. Thank you. I appreciate you attempting to break up my family. I, I got you back, man. Lot. It's all good. This is what you guys hired me for. This is, uh, if I do nothing else. It's what they always say. I break families apart. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> it's my unique niche in this industry. No one else has cornered the market like I have on that niche right there. So that's wonderful. Are, <laughs> is it, are you guys, are you guys still during this time right now? Are you guys still recruiting? Uh, you know, so how has it changed? I, I would say that we're probably not focused on that. We we're focusing on we're, we're and we're seeing competitors uh, do some, probably some aggressive recruiting. I, I guess our response is, uh, is we want to focus on our own people and make sure they're healthy, they're happy, they're, they're working. So we're, we're putting together programs to help our salespeople, um, both financially and for, um, and for our marketing and, and bringing you in, for example, for our, um, our weekly sessions. And you guys just, just did that. I mean, credit to you. Uh, I got a call from Bonnie, um, I think on Friday evening, Friday during the day or something like that. And uh, funny enough, I literally picked up the phone and I was like, I was about to reach out to you guys because I was going to reach out about having you on. Oh, yeah. And uh, so it worked out perfect. But uh, we set up a training for literally Sunday. It was less than 48 hours away. And uh, credit to you guys and your culture and everything else. We had more than 500 on live. Like forget about signed up. We had more than 500 on live, you know. Um, and I think that says a lot. Uh, about the culture and the community and the fact that that many people showed up that quick. So, so kudos to you guys. That was, that was impressive. We've been trying to do that uh, every day at two o'clock we do, and this is, of course, this is our, our uh, surrogate for that today, but every day we'll do something, uh, some conversation to keep people up and running. But so, so yeah. our focus has been that, and certainly there'll be opportunities for, uh, for for uh, recruiting and for doing uh, for doing that, but I guess we'll probably let our actions speak for that. If if, if we're supporting our salespeople and making sure that they're comfortable, then then that will speak um, mountains for us in the marketplace. And so, are you saying, just so I understand this correctly, are you saying that really right now during this time frame, the decision that you made um, was to really kind of go in all in on your people, at least while this whole thing's going on? not necessarily to be going outside and, and trying to grow whatever, but to focus all in on your people and say, Hey guys, during this time, we're going to give you the best training. We're going to, we're going to be in touch with you on a regular basis. Like we're going all in on this um, until the world opens back up. Our focus is here. Is that, is that kind of what, is that kind of what you're saying or am I, am I mischaracterizing no, that? That's it. That's, that really is our focus. And that's uh, smart. yeah, yeah. That's so, smart. So what do you think about all this, man? How, how has, uh, I mean, we're in unprecedented times right now. Um, how has this changed? How has this changed what you're doing every day? Uh, how has this changed with the conversations you're having? Like, how has this whole thing, like, what's, what's it been like? Well, it's, it, you know, it's interesting. I guess if you think about it, it, it is unprecedented. But, you know, every, every event that we've had 
is unprecedented. The recession we had last was an unprecedented recession. 9-11 was unprecedented. Even back in our founding, World War II was unprecedented in terms yeah. of its scale. So, so all of these are unprecedented, so, but there is consistent pattern in all of them. And that pattern is, is that you have to adjust to it. And what's, what is different is the speed, uh, the velocity of the change in terms mm -hmm. of this is very fast, uh, probably will be relatively fast coming out of it. So it's, it's adjusting to the velocity of it. But, but can, can you say that again, what you just said? I love what you just said, and I, I don't want people to miss that. You said this is very fast, and it's probably going to be coming out very fast. Like, yes. yeah. What so do you mean we, that? Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't really know. They're talking about whether it's a U recovery or a V recovery. It's probably, we think of it sort of as, as, as sort of a semi-V, and that it's a very steep drop. We know that. And, it, and here in Michigan, since we're not in an essential services state, yeah. we, our showings have stopped. So we're, we will be, um, you know, we're out of, uh, uh, although I am impressed at how creative our salespeople are yeah. in generating transactions virtually. So, but nonetheless, you know, it's business. Your non-essential thing is not tied to like the countrywide April 30th. Right. It comes down to your governor, right? Similar to how New York came out last week and said, okay, you're now essential. Whereas before that they were non-essential. The governor at any time can come out and say, Right. Even before the April 30th self-quarantine, you know, whatever, the governor can come out and say, you're essential again. Yes. Yeah. And, and we don't know if that will happen. Certainly, we have our, uh, uh, our Michigan realtors are working on, uh, on doing that, and we're involved in that as well. But um, so, so you have that. So in coming out of it, the question is, how will it come out of it? And, and we, right. it's and everyone's, anyone's guess, but a feeling is that it'll come out of it in sort of a two-stage piece. Okay. You bounce off the bottom, and the first thing, because this is true with really every recession recovery, is the first stage is you get buyers coming back in waves. Yeah. And even if there's a 50%, as a crazy number, 50% temporary unemployment, that means 50% are employed. So that's a pretty deep base of pent-up activity. So, so you're going to have a lower listing base. Listings might be off 30 or 40% during this time in terms of the inventory sort of wind down a little bit, but you're gonna have all these buyers attacking that listing. So you got this instant wave of buyers that's gonna flow Do out. you see a surge as a result of this? Uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard anything I've said and we might disagree on this. I don't know, that's why I like doing this live. I see an absolute surge coming. Like, like literally we go from, from a record spring, record low interest rates, people pulling their money out of the financial markets, which means it has to go somewhere else, right? And I see them looking at the real estate market and going, hey, real estate doesn't go down 20% in a day. Um, you look at empty offices, which means that now they can't turn those offices into retail. They've got to turn them into something, which will probably be residential because the population's going up. You look at all of these different things. My theory uh, is that after all of this, when the sun comes out and they say, get back to work, and what I'm, we're training all of our students on is, guys, get ready for the surge, because you could literally do more business in the next two months when this comes out than you did in the previous five months, like for the people that are prepared, right? That's my feeling, is I think a surge is coming. What, what, what is your, uh, what's your feeling? I think, it's, I think it's a surge that'll come in a couple of ways. If, if we look back at, um, at the last recession, um, we got a, a mini surge when the first time home buyer credit was hit in 2000. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, well, I forgot about that. The first time home I think, I think we'll see that will be the, the initial surge is that pent up demand will be released. All these buyers will get in the marketplace. They'll, they'll go after the limited number of listings. You'll get multiple offers. It'll be crazy, but it'll be it'll be many because there won't be that many listings. The listings will be down, and then the yeah, listings. Got gotcha. you. So a lack a lack of supply. Yeah. So you get this this very active sort of mini surge, and then the listings will follow as they did in 2008 as well. The listings will yeah. kind of come back into the market, and uh, then you'll see a second wave. So it's not a straight line recovery. It's a rolling yeah. upward yeah. movement, and how fast that moves. I mean, this, this is a controlled recession. This is yeah. different than Way anything. Way different. Before. This is a managed, actually managed intentional recession. Hit pause. With pause with financial backing to pull out of it. So this is all new in terms of how fast it'll come. But logically is, uh, logic says that it will come certainly a lot faster than, than anything we'd seen in the past. But whether that's a recovery by 
July or September or, or February, who knows, but it will come out. So. I know that everything I've seen as far as predictions for the GDP has been third quarter, second quarter down, third quarter surge, fourth quarter surge, like, you know, because it is, like you said, it's a, it's a manual uh, recession. Like it actually, you know, they're the ones hitting pause, right? Um, didn't you guys also, though, I mean, being in Michigan, you're affected by the fact, too, that didn't all the car companies shut down and then they opened back up 20% of them and then they, like, what, what happened there? And, and obviously still, that, affects, that affects you guys because... It is. It's still, still closed. Uh, they're, they're actually, they, they, they didn't open up like 20% too. of them? I, I thought I heard they opened up like 20%. Um, I don't... They, they may have, but not in uh, not I could in be wrong. Michigan. I just thought I, thought yeah, I saw that. I've not seen that in our, in our Michigan plants, but they may have in other parts, but uh, I haven't okay, seen Okay, maybe that. that's what I read. But either way, they closed. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing... Uh, Ford and GM are doing ventilators. They're doing uh, all kinds of... of uh, support for the for that but for the most part they are um so uh, so that's yeah we're, we are still an auto-based industry and auto-based yeah. economy so so that so we may probably move a little slower than other parts of the country out of it um but uh, on the other hand we were we were coming into it with a really strong market oh my so, god yeah believe me and like i said we work with a lot of your people and everything so i i saw what's going on i still see what's going on yeah um, where do you think agents and brokers focus should be right now on a daily basis? Oh, I think your, your search conversations are right on. I think it, it needs to be the first and well, first and foremost is, is, uh, I mean, we, we, are going through, there's, there's a, I guess there's a couple phases that you go through. The first phase is just, is the first couple of weeks that we were all at home and it's sort of getting organized. It's the, it's the, uh, um, it's the manage your deals, organize how your life is, manage how your kids are reacting and organize yeah. that. And now we're, we're moving into the sort of the old crap stage. And that is the, the, wow, I got myself organized. Now, how do I carry this forward? This is real. This is going to be here for a couple yeah, of this weeks. Is, yeah, now this is real. This is, yeah, I, I'm not able to like act like this isn't happening anymore. Yeah, yeah. I got my stuff organized. Now what do I do? So, so I think that that piece is... If you want to control your destiny, uh, there will be a shortage of, of listing inventory yeah. when it's released, unless you make a determination that you won't participate in that. You'll talk to your clients, you'll organize it. And certainly there'll be clients who don't want to list right now. And I get that. And we right. don't, you know, whatever clients want to do, that's fine. We, we don't push that. But at least make sure that it's organized. You have a plan. You spend the time to figure out exactly how you're going to do it. Give the client. So it's, it's a very specific action. Here are my potential listings. Here's my conversations with those sellers. Here's what they need to be doing for the next two weeks to get ready. Here's my buyers. They're pre-approved. They're ready to go. So when the gun goes off, you're in a better position to take advantage of that initial surge and the subsequent surges because otherwise you'll be trampled. No, I, I actually, that's a good point. But, uh, you know, I, I keep bringing up uh, one of our, our salespeople, uh, Red, posted a picture in our Facebook group. We have a Facebook group called Jared James Coaching. And it's free, everyone listening should join, it's awesome, it's got a ton of, all we do is you know, help people in it. There's no spam allowed, there's no you know, whatever, but he posted a picture of, uh, that basically said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, when a fisherman can't go out to sea because the waves are too large, they work on their nets. Yeah. And uh, the idea is that when it cools, they're gonna be able to catch more fish because they worked on that. And I've been trying to get the word out to your people and to so many other people that, Part of preparing for the surge right now, uh, part of what this exposed was how much, how client centered our calendars were and how, how little we were focusing on our actual businesses and we were more focusing on being customer service reps. And your ability right now to finally do all that stuff that you were going to do when you had time, now's the time. Like now is when you get your CRM set up and actually get your systems and processes. Now is when you get your transaction coordinator ready to go. Now is when you look at your, now is when you prepare for that surge, like literally, uh, or you can sit around and what's going on and whatever. And I like the example you used, you're going to get trampled when, 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 when we get that notice and it is coming guys, it's coming sooner than later. Like I love what you said there. This is so temporary. It feels uh, permanent. It, 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 it hurts like it's permanent. It, it's giving people anxiety like it's permanent. It's all of those things, but it is temporary. Like it's not here. It's a blip on the radar, ultimately, for those that can keep their mind right and ultimately work on their nets and get ready for that surge, they're going to be in a position to really pounce and take advantage of that, that opportunity when it comes. 
Whereas everybody else can be kind of like, like the bear coming out from hibernation, like, Oh, what's going on here? And they're going to, you know, they're going to miss that first wave right now is when we ultimately take advantage of that. So you like, you like the bear example, huh? <laughs> I, can, I can, I can visualize that. Yeah. I have, I've <laughs> never used that example before, but, but I, I think I will again after that reaction. <laughs> All right. So, um, we got to close here because we're heading into the last, uh, the last portions. I have a couple of really quick questions for you. Yeah. Uh, I see your bookshelf there, unless that is a, uh, unless this is zoom and you took a picture and that is digitally altered, uh, back there. Uh, you like to read? Yeah, these, these books, some of them I probably purchased at a, at a, uh, uh, a bookstore or art fair, but most of them, yeah, most of them are legitimate. So <laughs> they are. Do you still, do you still physically read or do you do audible or do you do podcasts? What do you do? I'm, I'm mainly a reader. So it's either, either on, uh, on my iPad or, or, or live paper, but I'm, I'm a reader. Yeah. What do you, uh, on a regular basis in today's world, what are you staying in touch with? Like, what are you, what are you reading, watching, listening to that is keeping you inspired, keeping you uh, 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 up to date, educated, you know, whatever? What are the places, people, things, whatever that you're following, listening to, whatever? You know, I, I think from, uh, from listening to and following, I think, uh, boy, there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, I touch it. I'll touch a lot of different things. Everything from the the gossip side of the Inmans of the world to to uh, 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 practical programs like yours and others that are that are giving uh, uh, you know they're giving good sound solid advice. So and outside the industry, um, there are a lot of things. Everything from you know uh, the it sounds a little hoi polloi, but Harvard Business Review has got some great stuff on. That's some great it. stuff, yeah, man. It really does. Um, and uh, um, everything from that to USA Today, it's also sort of the... the uh, like the physical paper, or are you like getting it online? Uh, most of it's online, but uh, yeah, most of it's online. You know, most every of once in a while... I'll, doing some physical paper. That, that's yeah, what every once, once in a while, throw in a People magazine or an Us just to keep me grounded too. Yeah, no joke, man. I was, I was telling someone, I forget who I was talking to the other day, and I said sometimes, obviously not right now, but when I'm traveling a lot, uh, I will legit be in an airport and I will go grab some gossip magazine that I can just sit on a plane and just completely zone out and not think of anything business related or anything. And I'll just read some articles about this relationships going this way and whatever, literally just so I can zone out for a minute. Like it's, it's the weirdest thing. And I, I realize now that I just put that out publicly, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's just the truth, man. Sometimes you just got to zone. It's one of the reasons why in today's world right now, it's driving me nuts not having live sports. Oh yeah. That's what I would zone out to at night. Like, like my wife has earplugs and, and, a, and a mask and uh, I'm usually go, go, go all day long. Like I, you know, it's, it's just, it's the way I'm built. And uh, one of the ways I'd zone out at night is, you know, put on a basketball game or put on a, you know, something like that, you know, but. You know, luckily I have a short memory of, uh, of who won the, uh, the NBA championship uh, in 1986 so when I see the uh, the Lakers Celtics game replayed I, I still enjoy it <laughs> oh, you kidding me? I watched I watched uh, the Lakers Celtics what was it uh, last night the game seven oh, the so Lakers Celtics game. with Kobe and Paul Pierce yeah, yeah. and did you watch that last I didn't night watch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah my wife texts me she goes upstairs and uh, I'm downstairs and all of a sudden I just happened to catch it and well, I didn't mean to I was just kind of like flipping through and seeing what was there and and I'm sitting there and I'm watching it and uh and then she texts me and she's like, are you coming up? And I'm like, hon, I'll be up eventually, but I'm in now. Like, I can't, yeah, right. I can't, I can't go away <laughs> right now. Like, this is, this is everything, you know? And it was just kind of watching that. Plus the fact that it was Kobe, you know, yeah. uh, with whatever. I, I, I didn't feel right turning it off, you know? It is, yeah, cool, by the way, seeing way. all these, these ones they're replaying. They did a Duke Kentucky game the other day. The, 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 oh my God, the Leitner turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, it's, it's, it's cool seeing it all, but still we've gotten to the place that they're they're putting on nba players playing each other on video games yeah clearly well that's, we need live that's, sports back that's bouncing at the bottom dude cl clearly we need live sports all right we had a question that my office just texted me to make sure that we ask you they said uh, dan what is your prediction for the msu versus um football game this fall oh come on <laughs> that's, that's would, how you get in trouble with your associates right well we are we are a uh 
we are a, a, a state family. Stuart and I are both from Michigan State. So, uh, and uh, as are our wives and all. So we're, we're, we're definitely state. But uh, this year, uh, I have no idea. Um, I, would, I would normally, I'm a Spartan at heart, but uh, I'll probably still root for the Spartans. But I am also, when, when uh, uh, MSU and U of M are not playing each other, I'm still, a, I'm a U of M fan. Oh, what a diplomatic answer. Yeah, no. What a diplomatic answer. Okay. So does that <laughs> mean you're a big been. Kirk Cousins fan? I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had I a feeling. I, I, how do you like me now? Yeah. yeah. That was, uh, I had a feeling you'd like that. Uh, all right. As we come into a close here, man, um, how can people connect with you? Like, uh, do you want people to connect with you? Do you sure. want to, like, whatever? Like, how can they connect with you? Uh, I would say they can any any way of uh, of social media, but but probably always the simplest is just email. It's Dan Elsey, uh, E L S E A at realestateone dot com. Um, you can text me. Uh, my text is two four eight 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 five eighteen twenty one. And look at you giving out text. You know what? Hey, fine. But all of our salespeople have my number anyway. So the rest of the world does. Then uh... you're out of your mind. My 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 wife and kids have my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like that's like almost about it yeah 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 so uh so if you want to reach out um any way you can at, at, you know on facebook on whatever i i catch it all but uh, but email is best i've got you tagged on here uh, as we come to a close just hang on here a second as we come to a close guys once again if you want to win a ticket to the 2020 uh jared james advance i'll be more dressed up and uh, not drinking beers at happy hour at the conference. So if, uh, if you want to win a ticket to that, just take a picture of your screen or a picture of you watching the screen. Uh, tag at Jared James today on Instagram and on Facebook at Jared James today uh, with the hashtag happy hour with Jared James. Um, just want to say to you, man, like, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we had great viewership on here. Um, we're going to put this on YouTube. We're going to put it on the podcast. Uh, you know, you guys have been just a, like an awesome company to, to work with uh, over the years. I love working with you guys, love working with the agents, love, you know, the whole thing. I love what you guys are doing uh, in your area. And uh, I really appreciate you kind of, and I think the viewership will, will agree with this as well. I appreciate you coming on and kind of being transparent and talking about the business and talking about the growth. And um, for those of you that are listening right now, uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, make sure you say uh, thank you to Danny to put it in the comments. Uh, hit like on on the uh, uh, on the Facebook Live there. Make sure you share it. I think this is a really worthwhile conversation uh, that's really good for our industry as a whole, regardless of what company people work for. That's kind of the whole point of these happy hours is hearing from the industry leaders, regardless of who it is that you work for. Uh, so hit share. Let's get this out there. Comment and say thank you to Dan because I really appreciate him coming on here. Uh, there was absolutely zero hesitation. You know, uh, when I was talking to your people and said, hey, let's you know let's get Dan on there zero hesitation. You, you came right on. And I think you were an awesome guest, man. So uh, I appreciate you, man, so much. Thank you so much for coming on. Right. Thank you. Enjoy awesome, it man. Hang out there one second. We're going to, we're going to get off of here. Like I said, guys, give that a share, leave a comment. We appreciate you guys uh, watching tomorrow at 5 PM Eastern. Come on right back here. Uh, I will have Chris Stewart on uh, of Berkshire Hathaway, president of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, get his thoughts on everything on the market. This is going to be a tough conversation to beat because I think that was a really good one. So Thank you guys. We love you guys. Uh, have a great night.